Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. We're so glad you could join us today. Uh, thanks for being flexible with us as we navigate this pandemic, uh, as we're only doing an online service this morning. Uh, continue to pray for our leaders, as well as those who are sick, uh, those who care for the sick around our community and, and really around the world. We know that God is with us and that he will help us through this difficult time as long as it lasts. As we get started, I have a few announcements for us. Uh, last week, I talked about a couple different ways that we uh, would like to invite you to take the next step in your faith journey. Uh, so the first, first way we could do that is through small groups, which we'll be talking about more uh, in December and January. But right now, we want to give you the opportunity, the second way, um, to get plugged into our church. And we have many different areas that you can sign up uh, that you can join with a ministry that we're doing as a church. Uh, so you can sign up today uh, in that plugged in area um, on a link on our website, wabashnaz.com, and you'll see the plugged in link. Our uh, annual missions Thanksgiving dinner is coming up this Wednesday, November 11th. Uh, we're asking that you provide uh, a side or a dessert, bring a side or dessert with you. And all proceeds for the auction um, that's also part of that go to the Shechem's Children's Home. Um, as we prepare for worship uh, together this morning, I wanted us to hear an encouraging word from Psalm 78. In the midst of the challenges of COVID and the presidential election, um, which I'm sure is, is still on many people's minds as well, this psalm reminds us to listen to the teaching that God gives us. We can be confident that if we follow Jesus and place our trust and hope in him, he will lead us in the way we should go. Psalm 78, verse 1. Listen, my people, to my teaching. Tilt your ears towards the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a proverb. I'll declare riddles from days long gone. Ones that we've heard and learned about. Ones that our ancestors told us. We won't hide them from our descendants. We'll tell the next generation all about the praise due the Lord and his strength. The wondrous works God has done. He has established a law for Jacob and set up instruction for Israel and ordering our ancestors to teach them to their children. This is so that the next generation and children not yet born will know these things, and so they can rise up and tell their children to put their hope in God, never forgetting God's deeds, but keeping God's commandments, and so that they won't become like their ancestors, a rebellious, stubborn generation, a generation whose heart wasn't set firm and whose spirit wasn't faithful to God. Thanks be to God. We're thankful that uh, he is the one that teaches us the way that we should go and that we have the privilege and responsibility to pass that on uh, to those that come after us, including our own kids and grandkids. Let's pray together. Holy and loving God, we come to you with hopes and fears, with convictions and doubts, with pain and joy. By your spirit, help us to see all things in the light of your word, our Lord Jesus Christ. By your spirit, help us to pray honestly, to listen attentively, and to encourage one another warmly. By your spirit, help us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would bless this time we have together as we worship all scattered across our community. We pray that you would teach us the way that we should go and help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, all glory and honor and power to him. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, 
I want to see you. I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. We sing holy, holy, holy To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Was and is, is to come. of lightning, rose of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you. Father God, we do thank you for the opportunity to just declare who you are again, the Holy One in our lives. And Lord, it's so great to be able to picture heaven and picture eternity with you. In the midst of all that we are facing, you always give us hope that better days and brighter tomorrows are always ahead because of what you have done to free us and rescue us and give us a home with you for all eternity. Today, God, we come before you and we lift different needs and concerns 
to you. But first, we just want to praise you for how you've been moving with the concerns that we've already been lifting. God, we thank you for moving in Marsha's life. And we know that she still has a ways to go in recovery. But God, you've brought her through such a tremendous journey so far. And we're confident you're going to keep leading her forward. We pray your continued healing for Marcia, that you just keep holding on to the Green family. God, we are so happy to hear that Linda is recovering in a, in a recovery center now. She's out of the hospital. And so we just thank you, God, for how you're moving in her life. And again, we know that she still has battles to fight, but you are moving with her every step of the way. We praise you for the healing you're bringing to Linda. And God, we thank you for moving in David Miller, my brother-in-law's life, how you've been helping him to, to become more and more alert uh, we are just asking you would help him to wake up from this coma, God, but we thank you for how he's moving and how he's responsive to different things that are going on around him. We just pray for your healing in his life. God, we ask that you would be with different needs that we bring to you right now, right where we are, God, in our homes or maybe we're work or we might be uh, visiting with somebody else, but we can worship together as a family. And so, God, we just lift our needs to you. Thank you for seeing us. Thank you for moving on our behalf. In particular, we want to lift just a, a couple of needs. And so, Lord, we lift the Armentrout family to you with the loss of Dorothy, Emily's step uh, grandmother. We just pray you'd especially be with Eric and Jeannie during this time and the rest of the family, that your peace and your comfort would cover them. And God, we think of uh, Dustin Fowler and, and his family and the loss of Dustin's mother. And we just pray again that you would just uh, be the God of peace and comfort, that you'd bring healing to Dustin's soul, to his father's heart as well. And you just hold on to them through this difficult time of loss in their lives. And thank you again, God, for what you are doing in our midst. We ask that you would continue to have mercy on us as a nation as we see the rise in COVID cases all across here and really all across the northern hemisphere, God, we just pray for your, for your peace and for your comfort, for your healing. We ask that you just rebuke this virus, that in your mercy you would move. And God, we ask that you'd be with our nation. We're still embroiled in this uh, presidential election. And even though there's been a winner declared, God, there's still battles that are ensuing. And so we just pray that you would, you would unite us as a people, that your peace would just come upon us over our nation. God, that you would bring a great healing and a great turning of hearts to you because you are who we really need. Not a president, not Congress, uh, congressional leaders, but we need you, Lord Jesus. So let your Holy Spirit just create another great awakening here in America and let us as your people move with you. God, we thank you for how you are meeting us right where we are. And we thank you now for speaking into us through your word. Give us ears that hear and hearts that receive what you have for us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us online right where you are. And uh, last week we kicked off a new series called Stress Less. And we began to open up last week that this life where we are filled with unhealthy stress is not God's plan for you or for me. And while there is never a time in our sin-scarred world where we will ever be you know, stress-free, God does long for us to experience his peace in the midst of the stress that we might face. So that instead of reaching this, this breaking point where our lives might erupt in chaos or anger or other ways that just bring regret into our lives. Instead, we could just take a step back with him and look to him and let his peace fill our lives and empower us to stress less. Now, one of the things that can really cause us the greatest amount of stress in our lives is when we just feel like we are running on empty. Let me just give you a picture of what I mean, right? So several years ago, I got a phone, from, a phone call from someone who needed uh, some help with some gas. And their tank in their car was near empty, and, and he needed to get to work. And so not only was his tank empty, but his wallet and his bank account were empty. So we met up, and he began to share what was going on in his life and some different transitions that, it, that he'd been facing. And you could just hear the stress in his voice, and you could just see it written all across his face. I mean, he was running on empty. And so, you know, I hooked the nozzle into his car, and I began pumping and filling that up. And, 
And, and as we're pumping, we're still talking, and I'm just trying to encourage him all that I could in this moment that we had together, knowing we didn't have a whole lot of time. But after pumping only a few gallons of gas into his car, I suddenly noticed that it was leaking gasoline, right? And not just a few drops. I mean, gasoline was pouring from underneath this car. I immediately stopped the pump, and I looked at him, and I said, um, I, I think I know why you're running on empty. I'm no mechanic, right? But even I can tell when a gas tank has a leak in it. His had several. I was only able to put about three gallons of gas in a tank that should have held 10 to 12. I think that leaky gas tank is a great picture of how many of us feel, right? We're always running on empty. Sometimes we feel that way relationally. Maybe it's in our marriage or maybe it's in our family or maybe with friends and, and we're just constantly pouring our lives into them, always trying to help them out and we start to feel drained. Uh, sometimes it's in the, in the busyness of work or the demands of your boss and, and no matter how much you do, right, there's always more to do. It just never seems to stop and, and maybe you feel like it's never enough. Sometimes it's, it's through unexpected turns that hit us personally, and maybe that's the end of a close friendship, or maybe worse, maybe it's the loss of a loved one to death. Especially in 2020, it is easy for us to feel empty because it feels like this year has just taken so much from us, right? It's taken our health with this global pandemic. It's, it's taken away our ability to gather as freely as we once did with family and friends. It's, it's different ways that we now navigate that, all the different restrictions that we have to face on where you can go or what you can do, right? It's taken away kind of the freedom there. And now it's even taken away much of our confidence as a nation about how we do elections, regardless of who you voted for, right? This week has just kind of been chaotic. We're living in a time when it is so easy to feel empty. And empty is never a great place to be. Because when we're running on empty, we find ourselves irritated and frustrated and on the edge. When we're running on empty, we tend to withdraw and isolate ourselves. We become the loner. When we're running on empty, other times we shift into overdrive, right? So we're overeating and we're overspending or we're overworking until we find ourselves even more overwhelmed. When we're running on empty, we often scramble to just try to fill our lives with anything and everything, even if it's unhealthy, right? So we pursue toxic relationships and we return to unhealthy addictions and we engage in unhelpful conflict as we just snap at people all around us. None of us are at our best when we're running on empty. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad today. But it is good for us to recognize the truth that we all hit empty at some time in our life. And if you're not there today, well, that's great. But if you are there today, I want you to hear the good news. You're not alone. And I want you to hear the great news. Empty is not God's plan for you. In fact, this is what Jesus tells us in John chapter 10. Put it on the screen for you today. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so on one hand, Jesus is, well, he's real with us, right? He tells us that in this world, we, we have an enemy. We have Satan who longs to steal, kill, and destroy, right? His goal is to get us empty and to keep us running on empty. Because when you're empty, you have nothing left to give to others. But in Jesus, on his death on the cross and rising from the grave, God is moved to defeat Satan and any power that he might have or hold over your life and mine. And more than that, he has now opened up this way for us to be filled with his life. And not just filled to, you know, capacity, not just topped off, 
But the word in the original language that Jesus shares with us here describes this overflowing of life, right? This more than fulfilling from God to us. Isn't that good? God longs for our lives to be full because only a full life has something to give to others, right? This is his desire for you. He wants you to have this full life where you stress less because you have something that you can actually give. And this now is what Paul shifts to look at in this last part of the letter that we're calling Philippians that we're going through in this series. And so let's dive into this, beginning in Philippians chapter 4, and let's pick things up with verse 8. This is what we read there. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there's anything that is excellent or praiseworthy, think, and right where you are, say that word think with me, right? Think about such things. If we were to sum it up, we could put it this way, and this is really the first point of the day. You and I can move to fill our minds with what is good. We can move to fill our minds with what is good. Now, we're not talking about a passing thought here. That's not what Paul is aiming at. He's aiming at what we dwell on, what we let soak into our minds and really into our lives. And this is why, right? Because we get this. What we intentionally think about and dwell on is what eventually becomes what we believe, and what we believe drives how we live, right? We don't want just anything to impact our lives and our beliefs and change how we live, right? Because there are some things we could allow into our lives that are just going to drain us in unhealthy ways. We don't want to live empty. We've been there. We've bottomed out there before. And so what we need to do is have this filter in place that will let the good in and that will reject what is not good for us. And that's really what Paul calls us to do in this word when he says, think about these things. In the original language, that word think is all about sifting. It's all about this life with a filter. So 10 years ago, Katie and I were celebrating our 10-year anniversary in the Rocky Mountains, it was beautiful, Colorado Springs. And, and one of the fun things we did while we were there is that we went to this place where we could pan for gold. Have you ever done that before? Right, and so they gave us this training time and teach you how to scoop up some sandy sludge and, and, and then you dip your pan back into some water and you begin to swirl the water and the water actually sifts, it filters the gold from the mud. So both Katie and I, well, we grabbed our pans and we set out to strike it rich. I mean, maybe we could pay for that vacation or maybe even future college educations. I mean, we were going to do this thing. And so we're scooping up that mud and we're gently swirling and we're sifting the gold from the rest. And we're really working, man. We're really getting into this thing. And after several rounds of panning and sifting, we ended up with a whole lot of well-washed mud but only enough gold to really cover the tip of one of our pinkies. I turned to Katie and I said, I think we should have been painting somewhere else, somewhere where there's a little less mud and a lot more gold. It's this work of sifting that Paul is driving at here that he's calling us to do. And we should get this, right? Because we live in a culture where there's a lot of mud in our social media. We live in a culture where there's a lot of mud in our entertainment, what we read, what we watch, what we listen to. We live in a culture where there's just a lot of mud around the water cooler at work where people are just sharing what's going on. And, and every day we're called to sift through all of that to find the gold, to find, Paul says, what is true. Not my truth, not your truth, but what lines up with God who alone is truth and defines what is true. He says we're to sift through and find what is noble or what is worthy of respect and honor. We're to sift through to find what is right. Not what feels right to me in the moment or what feels right to you, but what lines up with Jesus who defines and who is and who tells us what is right. We're to sift through to find out what is pure, 
what is wholesome, what is really good. He says we're to sift to find out what is lovely. And really that's the idea of calling forth love. What, what inspires you to show love and compassion to other people? We're to sift to find what is admirable, he says. This idea of what I should say or what I should do if I were in the very presence of God. Or what is excellent, what enriches life. Or, or something good that I can praise God for. God, just thank you for this thing in my life or this person in my life. Right? These are all ways and things that God uses to fill our lives. And so if this is really a struggle for you to find gold in the stuff that you're allowing into your life and into your mind, well, then let me maybe offer this suggestion that you should consider panning somewhere else. Make the move to where you know that there will be less mud, less of the unhealthy stuff that drains you, and more gold, more of the good stuff that God has designed to fill us. Now, while I'm right here, let me just pause for a minute and add this. It's this sifting process that often helps to expose holes that are in our tank. Now, while we were panning, we found out really quick if we had a good pan or not. I mean, these weren't expert pans. These were kind of cheap things where we were, okay? But by swirling the water around, you found out if your pan had holes in it. You could watch the water, the mud, and the gold running through your pan the same is true for our lives. As we move with God to sift what we're allowing into our lives, many times we begin to see the holes that we've allowed to form in our tank, so to speak. Toxic relationships that we've allowed to just keep draining us. Or maybe it's the inability to say no to extra demands by the boss or extra expectations placed on us by our family that are unrealistic. Uh, maybe it's unhealthy spending patterns or addictions that keep us empty and broke Maybe it's something else entirely. But it's when we move with God to do this sifting, that stuff like this, well, we begin to see these holes, right? And, and when we see the holes, now we can move with God to heal the holes so that he can really begin to fill our lives and our minds with good things. And that's what God wants for you and for me because only a full life has something to really to give to other people. And that really brings us to the second way Paul calls us to move. Now jump back with me to Philippians chapter 4. And here we pick things up with verse 9. This is what we read. Whatever you have learned or received or heard or seen in me, put it into practice. Put it into practice, right? So it's not just about filling our minds with something now. But now we're talking about moving through life. It's all about what we're doing. Right, we're putting it into practice. Let's, let's put it this way. We can move to fill our time with what is good. We can move to fill our time with what is good. And again, it's important for us to recognize that there are things that we do and ways that we move through life. Well, it drains us. And so what we're looking for are ways that we can move with our time and pursue things with our time that, are, that is going to fill our lives, okay? And, and Paul makes sure to give us some benchmarks so we know what to aim for. And the first benchmark is this, what you have learned or what you've received. And the words that he uses in the original language here point us back to God's word and especially to the teachings of Jesus, and so as we read through the Bible, and as we look especially at the life of Jesus, we see different ways of how God calls us to move with him. And so, for example, God calls us to rest, to take a day and just set it aside, not do your regular work, but instead look to him. Okay, so we're talking a little bit more than just a Nazarene nap. Though Those are okay. Those are actually good. Okay, but it's really this idea of taking extra time to spend with God in worship, personal time with Him, to let Him restore us, to let Him fill us. At other points, God calls us to give 10% of our income to Him, what we call tithing. And that's not just to pay the utilities at the church or even to pay the pastor's salaries, though Rob and I thank you for that. But we give, right? I give and you give to our church because we know our church helps other people here in Wabash and all around the world. We give to help others. Or we could look at how God calls us to serve and be there for other people, to live out love in tangible 
ways, right? And maybe that's by volunteering to help within our church by signing up on our plug-in ministry. You can do that right from our website. You can join a ministry team today with just a few clicks. Or maybe it's serving in a ministry in our community. Or maybe it's just helping your neighbor as you move in compassion. Uh, these and more are ways that we learn to live as we have received from Jesus. What we've received from him, we put it in to practice, right? Ways that we can move with God to fill our time with what is good. I, I get that some of this seems maybe counterintuitive, right? Uh, we get the resting part. Kirk, I'm, I'm there with you a day off. That's awesome. It's going to recharge me. Okay, but how does giving and serving really fill us? And it would seem like those activities would actually drain us, but it's really this kingdom principle that Jesus gives to us in places like Luke 6 that we're trusting in. This is what we read there. Give, Jesus says, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. When we live and when we give like Jesus, God promises to respond by filling us. And again, it's, it's measure for measure, not amount for amount. As we move to share what's best out of what we have, God moves to pour his best into us. Out of his greatness, out of his vastness, out of all that he has, he wants to bless your life. Paul says it's not just about what we've learned or what we've seen in Jesus or learned out of God's word though, okay? Here's the next benchmark he gives. But it's also what we've seen and heard from other Christians, for the Philippians, it was about what they'd personally seen, what they'd personally heard from, from Paul. Now, we don't have the opportunity to meet Paul this side of heaven, but all of us have good Christian people in our lives who've helped shape us, right? Who've shaped our lives. Pastors and teachers, counselors, parents, friends, and more. People who have been there to encourage us. People who have loved us when we felt unworthy. People who've reached out to help us when we were struggling. And so Paul is coaching us here to look to those people. And really to surround ourselves with those good people. People we can look to and say, you know what? That's what it looks like to love God and to love people and to really follow Jesus. I can see that in them. I can hear it in, in how they talk and in what they say. And I can now duplicate that in my life as I fill my time and I fill my life with what is really good. It's just another way that God moves to fill our lives. This time it's by filling us with good people. And aren't you thankful for the people that he's brought into your life? I know I am, right? And that really leads us into the last step, which is where we actually really need to begin. And here it is. I can move to fill my life with God who is good. Here's how Paul puts it, the last part of Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. He says, and the God of peace, right? The God of peace. Doesn't that just sound good? The God of peace will be with you. you you've probably seen this before. It's the famous painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's entitled The Creation of Adam, and it shows God and Adam with their hands stretching toward each other. One of the things I love about this painting is how God is leaning and how God is straining to reach Adam. But Adam seems a little more relaxed, not nearly as focused or intent. But here we have the very hand of God reaching for the hand of man. Don't you love it? Can you just imagine with me if Adam had been just a bit more serious? If Adam had leaned forward just another six inches, if he would have just grabbed on tightly to God's hand, how would that have changed his life? For me, that image really captures what it looks like to fill our lives with God. It's more than just believing in God. It's more than just that he's out there somewhere, right? It's more than just attending church services in person or even online. It's, it's more than just even praying a prayer to invite Jesus to forgive you and save you. Those are all good. Those are all needed. But we also need so much more. 
we need to live hand in hand with God every day. It's all about intentionally pursuing Him. It's all about leaning another six inches into Him than what you're doing right now. What would that look like for you? What would it look like for you right now to lean six more inches closer to Jesus? Maybe that's consistently getting into His Word every day. Maybe it's making more time for Him throughout your day. Maybe it's the step of joining a small group to help you grow in your faith and what it means and looks like to follow Jesus. Or, or maybe it's the step to ask someone to be your accountability partner to help you intentionally grow in your faith. Someone you can be open and honest with. Someone who will encourage you and pray with you. What would it look like for you to just lean another six inches closer to God in your life today? Because the greatest way we can experience a full life, I'm telling you, is when you intentionally move to fill your life with more of God. Again, this is God's desire for you. He didn't create you to be empty or always running on empty, where life is just at, you're always at your breaking point, right? You're stressed to the max. No, 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 God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to stress less. He wants this full life for you because it's only when you're full that you now have something that you can actually give to other people. You can rise up to actually pour out his love on your family and, and on your friends. You can share his life where you work or where you go to school. You can really live this life of purpose and legacy that we all long to live. And so if you feel empty today, this is good news for you because today you could turn to God and you can begin the process of having him fill your life. I'm going to tell you, this isn't a quick fix. God doesn't work in quick fix ways. And there's a reason we got to empty in the first place. And so God wants to move in your life purposefully. He wants to move carefully as he recreates your heart and he fills your life. And that begins here and now as you just open your life to him. And it continues tomorrow as you open your life again and the next day and the day after that. And so here in this moment, this is really what I want us to do. I want us to begin this, and I want us to do it this way. I, I want us to invite God to search our hearts and to point out to us why, why we're feeling empty, why we're feeling depleted, why we're feeling stressed. And as we do, here are some questions that I think we can ask him to answer as we pray to him right where you are. And so maybe it's one of these three things that God wants to work out in your life. But here's the first one. God, where do I need to sift some things either into my life, the gold, right? Or maybe I need to sift things out of my life, the mud. Or where do I need to move, God, so that I'm sifting through less mud? Or maybe I need to move where I can get something a little more valuable and good to fill my life. And so God, in this area of sifting, how would you have me change? How would you have me move? What would you have me do to fill my mind and my life with more of the good? Here's the next question. God, how can I fill more of my time with what is good? Where do you want me to move and to be more like you, Jesus. What I read and what I have learned in the scriptures, how can I apply that so I can be more like you? Uh, God, what can I do or who can I get close to who will help me grow closer to you? Bring that person to mind, even now. Someone, maybe it's in a small group or maybe it's a friendship I can form or maybe an accountability partner, but who can I get close to who will help me know what it means to love you and love people and follow Jesus? Or maybe it's this last question. God, how can I just lean six inches closer to you today? How can I just take this small step that will help me grab a hold of your hand more tightly than I'm doing right now? What can I do to be more intentional about filling my life 
with you. God wants to speak to you today. He wants to fill your life. Let's move with him to do it. Let me pray with you. Father God, we thank you for the amazing work that you are constantly doing in our lives. We thank you that you are a God who longs to fill us with not just good things, but with the best that you have to give us. You love us with this amazing love. We just scratch the surface in understanding it. And today we just want to open our hearts wide to you, God. There are many of us who are feeling empty. There are many of us who are feeling depleted. There are many of us who are feeling stressed. And, and God, we need you to fill us. And so maybe it's in this area of sifting what we allow into our minds, or maybe it's in the area of how we fill our time, or maybe it's in the area of being more intentional about pursuing you. Speak to us. Reveal to us today how we can be filled by you. And then empower us to have the courage to make the change and move with you so that you can fill us. We love you today, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the work that you are doing in us. To your name we pray. Amen. There is a healing. His love is deeper than the sea. His mercy, it is unfailing. His arms are a fortress for the weak. Let faith arise. Let faith arise.
as I pour out my heart these things I remember Let faith arise.